Thank next you. topic, which is um, by Abhijit on Ansible Cloud Team Update. Yeah. Uh, hello everyone. My name is Abhijit Kasurde. So today I will be presenting uh, the some of the brief updates from the Ansible Cloud team. Uh, so my name is Abhijit Kasurde. I work in uh, Cloud team. Uh, so everybody knows me on uh, IRC as Mr. VMware because I mostly work on VMware. Uh, apart from that, I uh, take care of other uh, cloud platforms like AWS and uh, ServiceNow. Uh, so that's me. Uh, so let me share my screen. Uh, feel free to stop me if you have any questions uh, uh, regarding the uh, regarding the cloud updates. Uh, yeah. So uh, I would like to thank Jill for uh, making these slides for me. Uh, and let's get started. So. Yeah, so what do we manage in Ansible uh, Cloud Collections? So basically, we manage Amazon.aws, Community.aws, then Kubernetes.core, uh, which was uh, previously known as Community.kubernetes. Uh, then we manage uh, Community.okd, which is upstream version of uh, OpenShift uh, collection. Uh, OKD is the OpenShift uh, upstream version. Uh, then we manage community.vmware and vmware.vmware uh, rest which is a uh, rest based uh, vmware collection so these are the collection that we manage as of uh, june 2021 uh, and uh, apart from that we also manage servicenow.iitsm so basically it is it uh, service management tool uh, that is uh, comes under under the umbrella yeah so these are the AWS collection updates. Uh, so both collections are released uh, to their 1.5 release, uh, 1.5 version in April month. Uh, then we have these uh, modules which are um, moved from community.aws to amazon.aws. So basically, these are the modules: uh, EC2 AVPC underscore net gateway, then IGD uh, IGW gateway then EC2 VPC endpoint, uh, VPC route table, and EC2 instance. And all of these modules have their counterparts uh, with their uh, fact gathering modules, that is info modules, as of you know. Uh, then going forward, uh, we removed Python 2.7 support uh, from the main uh, Boto3 library. As you know, the Amazon uh, recently uh, released that they are not going to support Python 2.7, uh, basically Python 2.0 um, uh, version. So we also moved in that direction. And now uh, all the collection under AWS uh, now only support Python 3. And going forward, we also uh, we are planning to have uh, all the test cases and in integration tests regarding. Then we um, I think we lost a Pidget. At least um, I, I can't hear him. Yep, same. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, till what part uh, did you hear me? Hello. Uh, was it just the Python support? Okay. So uh, let me repeat uh, myself. Um, so uh, as of you know, uh, Amazon uh, moved from uh, Python 2.7 support, and they uh, deprecated the support in Porto 3 library, which is a main library for uh, automating AWS. So we also moved in same direction, and we removed the support of Python 2, uh, 2 from the main uh, AWS collections, uh, basically both of them, community.aws and amazon.aws. Uh, now we have new Boto3 Boto Core support uh, policies as well. Uh, you can check out the new policies in the uh, given collection itself. Yeah. Now some of the updates from Kubernetes uh, slash OpenShift. So Kubernetes uh, 1.2 dot uh, release was uh, done in the February month. 
uh, with that release we have a helm template module and optional helm diff support uh, which improves the idempotency of the helm diff modules uh, so helm is basically the uh, package manager of kubernetes uh, then uh, coming uh, in the late spring we are planning to have 2 dot release for uh, kubernetes uh, with the major changes, uh, we completed the repo migration from community.kubernetes to kubernetes.core. So there was a um, concern about the naming convention of the Kubernetes collection and the repo. So that's why we addressed that uh, concern and we migrated from community.kubernetes to kubernetes.core. Uh, so kubernetes.core is a vanilla Kubernetes, uh, which does not rely on OpenShift library and has vanilla Kubernetes Python uh, bindings to it. Um, so that is the major difference that is uh, happening in the two dot release. Uh, rest of the things like functionality, uh, features, and everything is uh, as is. Uh, the only thing is that you don't have to install uh, OpenShift library for community bits. And if you want to automate OpenShift, uh, then you can always go for community.okd or Red Hat supported Red Hat dot OpenShift uh, collection. Yeah. Uh, with two dot release, we have a, a major improvement uh, since we are using Ansible Turbo uh, mode. So basically, for all those who don't know what is Ansible Turbo, Ansible Turbo is based on um, uh, the async uh, async io uh, technology of python 3 uh, which improves the quality of communication between the uh, endpoints and uh, basically it uh, makes the uh, connection between the server and the client persistent and improves the performance so uh, we introduce cloud.common uh, collection with this turbo functionality and uh, now ansible uh, kubernetes collection uses this same functionality to improve its performance yeah so if you want to check out uh, there's a new blog on the ansible uh, blog itself uh, i'll link that blog in between uh, so you can check out how uh, you can use ansible turbo to integrate with existing uh, collection to improve their performances so basically this uh, performance gain can be uh, gain in a collection where you are using rest apis or uh, similar functionality okay uh, then uh, we are planning to remove openshift inventory plugin and kts uh, auth module uh, because uh, they are moved to community.okd and uh, that's the move happening over there um, like i said uh, earlier uh, we did a major refactoring in the kubernetes.core, uh, which was previously known as community.kubernetes, uh, because basically we wanted to use Kubernetes client Python library as a uh, first class reason rather than using OpenShift library uh, for as a helper function. Yeah. Uh, for Kubernetes collection or for OpenShift collection, we uh, heavily want uh, community support. Uh, we want your uh, opinions then we want uh, your use cases how you use uh, kubernetes collection uh, in your day to day life or what are the pain points that you face in automating the kubernetes collect, uh, kubernetes environment so that we can incorporate your feedback and then uh, in uh, try to develop around it so that is the uh, soon we are uh, launching um, uh, poll for that and like we'll be asking uh, users uh, what are the things that they want in the kubernetes collection yeah we also uh, planning to have uh, automated roles uh, for kubernetes where you can install kubectl you can install Q uh, helm uh, package manager and all that so those those things are in pipeline and uh, will be coming in upcoming months uh so now we'll move to, move on to vmware uh, so in community.vmware is the modules uh, new uh, so in order to manage the tcp ip stack of uh, vmware host we have this module called vmware host uh, tcp ip stack uh, then we can uh, for doing an instant clone of the uh, vmware guest uh, we have 
module called as their guest instant clone and uh, to manage the storage policies regarding the vmware guest we have introduced a new module called as vmware underscore guest underscore storage policy uh, so these are the uh, these are the versions in which they are introduced okay uh, moving on to so entry plugin called as vmware underscore host underscore inventory which will query all the facts and uh, inventory related details regarding the host uh, host being uh, vmware esxi uh, the hypervisor itself uh, so al we already have uh, vmware guest which is a guest inventory plugin now we have a vmware host as a host inventory over there yeah uh, regarding to uh, the vmware rest uh, we are planning to have two dot release in a uh, couple of weeks now uh, this uh, VMware REST has these modules uh, inbuilt into them. So content local library, then content subscriber library. Uh, basically, these two uh, modules will manage the content library function of VMware, uh, which is introduced in uh, 7. Dot release, and it is fully functional. You can create local libraries, you can create subscribe libraries, you can query them using info modules itself. Uh, apart from content local library and subscribe library, we have uh, vAppliance management modules. So basically, uh, it adds the functionality of managing all the vAppliances uh, to the VMware REST. And uh, uh, VMware REST basically uh, uses REST API. So that is the basic difference between community.vmware and vmware.vmware REST. So we don't rely on any third party library like Py ibomame or vsphere automation sdk uh, in the vmware rest yeah uh, now moving on to uh, communicating to us uh, so we have these uh, irc channels basically on libra chat we also moved on from freeno to libra chat uh, with these channels uh, if you want to talk to us uh, regarding the aws we have ansible aws channel then if you want to talk to us uh, regarding the kubernetes we have have ansible kubernetes and for vmware we have ansible vmware yeah so basically we want your feedback uh, regarding the new model additions we want your uh, criticism about like what are the pain points that you face uh, with using uh, different collections that are under the cloud and uh, we will we will uh, definitely be happy to address those issues for you and uh, happy to automate your infrastructure over here yeah so that's it from my side uh, if you have any question please let me know my irc nick is akasurde and same is on the github itself you can ping me on irc or mail me uh, we don't have any slack channel uh, as of now uh, yeah yeah thank you uh, for your time thanks abhijit um any questions about uh Cloud automation for Pidget. I hope uh, everybody understand everything or I was too fast for everybody. <laughs> uh, I think we, we lost audio from you for a couple of times, but um, but yeah, yeah we, I think uh, we, with the slides and, and hopefully the recording, we can get most of the stuff. Oh. Yeah. Sorry for the trouble. Like oh, no, no, yeah. it's OK. Sometimes the connection that happens. <laughs> yeah, connection was more tricky. The speed was quite OK. Yeah. It's raining in India. That's why maybe. Okay, if we don't have any question, we can move on. Carol, you can take over. Thank you. Thanks, Abhijit. All right. Yeah, um, thanks. We have, uh, actually, the, the next thing will be a break. But since I think we have a, a few people joining us uh, in the past half hour or so, we can catch up with a few introductions. Greg Sutcliffe, would you like to give a short intro? I think, Carol, thanks. Um, so, yeah, my name's Greg. I work with Carol and Gundalo and the rest of the Ansible uh, uh, community team. Uh, I can't talk today. 
Um, yeah, I work with the rest of the community team. Uh, officially, I'm the data scientist. I do a lot of the statistics and try to understand like how the community is structured and how we can um, make sure everything's running along fine. But more recently, I have had my community architect hat back on, and I'll be talking a bit about that in about 20 minutes. Um, so I've got some got something to say there. So you're not getting a stats update from me uh, this time, um, unless you want one this afternoon, in which case, fine. But you know, we can do that as a lightning talk. All right, thanks. Um... I also want to mention that throughout the day, we will have polls, um, which you can find in Google Meet. If depending on the interface, the new or the old, it's basically like a triangle, square, circle, a bunch of shapes, either in the top right corner or bottom right corner. And you can click on it, and there should be polls that um, you can see and respond to. I will be adding a couple more shortly. So, um, and anybody else I missed who would like to do an introduction? If not, we can start the uh, break a couple of minutes earlier, and uh, when we get back, we can hear from Greg. All right, let's, I'll set the timer, give me a minute. Okay, have a quick break and uh, refill your coffees and uh, so on. And feel free to continue chatting as well. I'd like to introduce Alexei Znamensky. Uh, he is our new community general maintainer, uh, Gundalo. Congratulated uh, him among other folk, folks uh, with getting commit there. And uh, I checked yesterday, uh, Alexei has done more than 250 pull requests uh, in the Ansible wow. collections organization. Keep, keep, keep it low, man. My wife might hear it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Alexei. It, it's a pleasure to work with you on Ansible. Thank you, guys. As I wrote in the the other uh, PR, it's it's a, a privilege uh, and a pleasure to work with an amazing crew such as you and Felix and the rest of the guys. Mostly you two, Amin, uh, well, a lot of people. And uh, I won't be able to to stick around for too long. It's uh, night here in New Zealand, and uh, soon enough, I'll head to bed. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, even for a little while. So, yeah, and, and Thank thanks you, for all your contributions to um, the collections and community general. A pleasure. Thank you. All right, welcome back to Ansible Contributor Summit. Next, we have Greg Sutcliffe and uh, Matrix and Bridge. Thank you, Carol. So yes, not a stats talk. Uh, let's I'll talk about Matrix for a little bit. Um, so I want to um, give a little update uh, on on where we're at with all the all things chat. Uh, in, unless you've been living entirely on Slack, uh, i.e. under a rock, uh, for the last month or so, um, then you uh, probably are aware that there was some uh, seismic shifts in the open source uh, world of chat in the last month um, with the, the, the fun that is Freenode and the new Libera chat servers. Um, obviously, Ansible has taken the decision to move its IRC presence to Libera chat, and that's a perfectly rational, sensible decision. That said, this presented an opportunity to evaluate what we want out of chat and uh, where we think chat is going. So I have spent some time looking into this. I, uh, it is no secret that I am a big fan of Matrix. I have been using it for many years. I first heard of Matrix back in 2012, um, and I tried to use its IRC uh, presence then, and it was terrible. But Sorry, you know, it's come a long, long, it's come a very long way uh, since uh, 2012, and since about 2016, 2017, I've been using it as my daily driver uh, for presence on IRC and other places as well. So the first things to say are, 
IRC is not going away. Anybody who is happy with IRC need not worry. We are not going to be suddenly like, nobody's on IRC anymore, stop using it. This is clearly nonsense um, because 90 odd percent of our users today are on IRC. This is absolutely fine. Uh, it's it's not going to go away anytime soon. We're not planning to get rid of it. We don't need to. And that's the key thing um, as we, we move on when we'll talk about bridges. But I think there is an opportunity to do more. Um, a lot of the features that come in Matrix are very, very nice uh, and present, uh, a, present a number of benefits. Uh, firstly, for people already in the ecosystem, there's still a large amount of choice. Uh, but for new users, it's more of the experience that they'd be expecting. Uh, if people uh, rock up to our documentation and say, hey, I want to ask a question, being able to you know, go to the how to contact us page, click a link and be in a matrix room in a matter of seconds, I think has a great deal of value. Moreover, uh, there are moves in the matrix ecosystem around a thing called spaces, which I'll try and demonstrate shortly, um, which will make it very nice to um, get an overview of the scope of the Ansible um, community, which I think is a difficult thing to do um, at present. Um, we have, you know, we have the documentation that, that shows like all the places where we chat and that's fine, but, it's it, it, it you know you can always you can always go further so um so i can try and show some of that as well i think there's also uh, the opportunity to support other good open source projects um and that's something that you know fedora particularly interested in doing they're moving to matrix they're going to be uh, paying for hosting from element who are the primary developers of the matrix protocol and um we've been talking to element as well we had a really nice meeting with them yesterday and uh, that's been very positive they've answered a lot of my questions there is a great big uh chance to um directly collaborate with them if there are particular features that we want uh, doing or um you know things like that so this isn't about asking people who are currently part of our ecosystem to change what they're doing uh, because that isn't going to work. Everyone is happy with their setup in, in large part, and, and I wouldn't ask them to change. If they want to, that's great. And it's worth remembering. Um, I remember seeing a lot of discussion on, on the Libera chat um, GitHub issue about the problems people see with Matrix. And the thing that struck me was that there seems to be a big conflation between Matrix and Element. Um, Element is the default, uh, the, the, what you might call the flagship client for Matrix. It is made by the same set of developers, and it's always the first one to get new features that go into the specification. But it, but Matrix is only the specification. It's like arguing that you don't like SMTP because of Gmail. Um, you know, there are many, many, many different clients out there. If you like your minimal, if you want to get involved in Matrix, but you like your minimal, then there are. Well, I mean, Element itself has a very dense mode that looks a lot like XChat, but you can go to things like the plugins. For WeChat, and there are much more sort of minimal UI versions as well. Um, so you can get everything from the command line interface right up to the full full web interface. It's all there, um, and the spec is is available. Um, so I wanted to just kind of dispel that. It's also um, worth the other thing that was raised in issue nineteen um, was how IRC and Matrix play together. Uh, things like um, being able to edit previous lines, uh, what happens with line length. Uh, these things are fair concerns. I think Toshio raised them originally. Um, we have, uh, so there is public um, information that I can link to that's, that uh, the Matrix team are very aware of this. They are adding configuration capabilities so that a, a, a particular room can choose how Matrix interacts with IRC and what it does in those scenarios. So if it becomes irritating to a large part of the community to have you know, editing, then we can stop it um or or configure it in different ways same for line length and you know what happens to uh matrix links and, and things like that so this is this is it is and you know we've, we've got this communication with element now uh, and that gives us a, a way in to sort of say look you know this is important to a fairly large community and they're very excited about that uh so um as a result um i think we can resolve a lot of those issues uh there's a lot more coming down the line as well I want to just um, talk about why I think this is important, though. Uh, so, you know, the, so, so to sum up that first part, I want I want to see us make more use of Matrix. People who don't like it shouldn't need to be too concerned. We're not going to take anything away, and we're going to have the tools to mitigate any of the, or, or hopefully mitigate the problems that might uh, occur between uh, communication. Why do I think it's a good idea? I think it comes down to a few things. And I'm gonna pull up a link that I think David Samard originally provided, uh, which was the spec that the OpenStack Zool 
uh, team put together for their proposal to move to Matrix. And now this is a, this is the open dev team. They will undoubtedly end up running their own infrastructure. But you know, it's the, the, a lot of the points they make are the same. Um, firstly, for new users, um, not having to run a bot or, or a bouncer to get presence is something people have come to expect. You know, most other chat systems provide this by default now. Uh, and I think it is a, an arcane notion to most people to have to run some kind of bouncer. So the idea that, again, they can jump in in something that's in their browser, and yet they can move to a dedicated client if they stick around, but at least to start with, they can jump in, they can ask questions, and come back and get those answers later is a big win. It also means we can set up the channel authentication um, properly because having to join IRC is one thing. Having to do the authentication dance with Nick Serve and Chan Serve is absolutely arcane to most people these days from the conversations that I've had. Um, if you're not familiar with it, it is a very different process to what most people used to. Because again, they're very used to uh, a web-based sign-up process, right? That's what most things use today. And that's what they would get uh, out of uh, clicking on the matrix link. It's uh, possible to add single sign-on. So again, uh, you know, single sign-on comes with its own set of privacy concerns. You know, I would always create my own account, but it, again, most users are going to be happy to use their Google account or their Facebook account, their GitHub account, and get a sign-up and be in the chat room in seconds. And that's possible to do in such a way on the IRC side that we still have the spam protection, but Matrix users can jump right in and chat as well. Uh, so we, we take away a lot of that um, barrier to entry for new users, which I think is important. For people who exist entirely on Matrix, um, there are some other benefits as well, um, which is things like, by default, if you start one-to-one -one chats, they are encrypted. Uh, this is a good security benefit. Now, I, I suspect most people are well aware that public chats are public, but there is a tendency to start off with good intentions. And then if you have a long time one-to-one -one chat with someone, it can drift into other areas over time. Having that stuff protected by default is a nice side effect. Um, and there are there are other uh, small things like that. There's a long, long list, but I'm going to put the the full spec into chat now for you. So that you know, there's a lot there. But one comment they made really, really stood out to me, which is about uh, mindset. They said that even though it makes very little difference to existing users because they will be able to continue whatever chat system they're comfortable with. Adopting Matrix as a default signals that we are aware of the benefits it brings and want to make more use of it. And I think that's where I stand. Now, I, I've, uh, I, I, I can't say that that's what we're going to do. I think that's, I think it's true that we want to make more use of Matrix. Um, I'm not going to go so far as to say it's definitely going to be the default thing. That's the thing we need to talk about. But I think it's got a lot of benefits. Now. I could just sit here and talk, 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 but I don't think that's a lot of fun. So let me try and show a few things um, in the, what, 10 minutes that I've got left, five minutes I've got left. Um, so let me screen share here. Um, so this is uh, my element clients, uh, which hopefully it will show up. Um, so let me yes. know when you're seeing that. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So this is this is Element with a dark theme and a fairly small font. I appreciate that probably won't be very readable, but it's not really about writing text. I want to show uh, wider features. So first thing I want to talk about is bridges. Um, so we've heard a lot from, I mean, just in the time that I joined, um, when we'd already been going for an hour when I joined, I've already heard two separate speakers say, come and join us on Slack. Um, and that's fine. I'm not going to say don't do that. But but I, as an ex-community manager for Foreman and, and you know, sort of doing some community stuff here with Gundalo, bugs me that we fragment the community in that way. Um, so as a result of um, that, the ability to add not just IRC, but also Slack, and potentially you can do what's called double bridging, which means that you can have Matrix, IRC, and Slack all existing in the same room. That is extremely nice. It helps us to reunify a fragmented community. Can't do it for everything. Um, to, to give you an example of where that isn't possible, um, if we look at, oh, I'll, I'll show in a minute, but um, yeah, let me come back to that point, actually. The other thing that's worth talking about here with these integrations is that we have an opportunity to do some things that are really nice. If uh, I don't know if anybody was at FOSTEM, 
uh, this year, but Matrix worked with Foster and put together an amazingly built system uh, for running conferences on Matrix. And I hacked together a proof of concept for that in a matter of two hours, uh, which would allow us to do what we're doing today, but on Matrix. And where I see that being a benefit is instead of having a separate silent process, a separate um, place to do the videos as we're doing right now, a separate chat, which is different to where we chat on a daily basis, we can have it all in one place. So if you can imagine for a moment uh, that this is the Ansible community room, let's assume also that it is uh, bridge to Libera uh, so that we are all there chatting. And I will, before anybody asks, I have a plan in mind for the IRC users, so let me finish my, my, my quick demo here and I'll talk about that. Um, we can do things like, I'm going to use Jitsi as an example, um, but actually it works with, with other uh, platforms as well. I was using OBS Ninja and sharing an iframe. Um, but you can see here, this isn't going to actually work uh, because my camera is already in use um, by, uh, by Google. Uh, but you know, I can add a conference here. Um, we can have other things. So as I say, you can do like a more presenter, blue jeans prime time style thing where you have just the presenters in. I think that would actually be better because we're going to have like 400 people in, in the Ansible community room. Um, but you know, you can do, you can do nice things. You can have, um, you know, you can do uh, an Aceto pad for your, for your schedule as well. So like that, um, and we'll put that in the sidebar. Here it is, so I can put that here. And so yeah, you can have the schedule, you can have the talk, you can have the chat, you can, and you can keep that history, right? It's part of our daily chat within the Ansible community room. I think that's got a lot of benefit rather than it all being off on one side and only a small number of people um, having the chance to, to take part, having it all in one place, I think has a lot of benefit. That said, you're gonna ask me, what about IRC? Well, the nice thing about, um, let me, that's, ah, where's it gone? Here we go. So if I go back here and get rid of the Jitsi for a minute, um, the other thing you can do, as I said, and this is what I'd probably be interested in, is you can add a custom widget. And in this case, it would be something like, um, uh, I won't put the URL, but it, it's basically um, the stream uh, URL. And so you could share that stream URL anywhere else, right? You could stream to Vimeo, to Peertube, you can get it direct from OBS Ninja, and you can share that for people who are not on Matrix, so they can just open that in a tab in their browser, and they can still participate in the chat and watch the videos. So this is all fine. Um, it is very similar uh, interface. Uh, so th there's nothing lost by not being uh, on a Matrix-based client. Uh, it's just that you get that slightly nicer kind of everything in one place uh, part of Matrix. Let me, um, yeah, Brian Coke has asked a question about uh, direct messages um, and Alex has clarified, but yeah, if Brian, you could clarify um, what Alex has asked there, then I can probably try and answer the question. But yeah, it's not clear to me what you mean there either. Um, talking quickly about spaces, as I only have a couple of minutes left. Um, so you'll see on the left here, I've got all of these lovely little icons, um, which are, so spaces is in beta at the moment, you can opt into it. Um, and it will be, I guess, probably months at least before it makes it out of beta, but I expect it to because it's a very nice feature. Spaces is analogous to, I'm going to use email as my connection again, because I think it works. It's a bit like folders. So in the same way that emails can be in multiple folders, um, you can have rooms in multiple spaces and you can have private spaces for yourself where you're just organizing different types of rooms that you're in, but you can also make public spaces. Um, and so if I go to the Ansible community space and I click explore, you can see here, I've got a bunch of rooms. Uh, and so this is what I mentioned about being able to see the breadth of the community, which I think is a, a huge deal. Um, so this is the community test room that I was just created. Um, we've got the Ansible community room, which is on Matrix. And this is the Libera chat one, which are currently separate. Now, my goal would be to bridge those together so that they're a single thing, so that people don't have to choose which one to jump into. Uh, but if I go in here, you can see this is Libera. This is us talking about this very talk. Uh, and I can go back here, explore rooms again. Uh, we can put the working groups under here. We can put in all sorts of things. We can have different groupings. You can see we've nested spaces. So Ansible working groups is a space which has more spaces. I'll give you a quick uh, view of a bit more full-fledged version of this. If I explore the Matrix HQ uh, community space, you can get an idea of just how far you can take this, right? It's enormous, um, but it's nicely organized, right? We've got the crypto space. We've got the chat client space. Whoops, I didn't mean to go into that. I meant to actually collect it. Um, you know, it's, it's really, really nice to be able to like go through and see what people are working on and where you might want to jump in. If you put yourself in the shoes of a new community person jumping in, where do I go? The ability to land here 
and you can see some rooms are suggested so we can suggest maybe ansible and also answer from community and then people can come and ask questions we can signpost them to the right places um, i think that's going to be very helpful for people being able to find where they participate i mentioned some problems about, about integrations and bringing the community back together one example of that would be gitter so this is the ansible gitter room Gitter joined Matrix at the start of the year, um, and so it's all part of the same network now. So this is the Ansible Gitter room, and there's just nothing I can do about this, right? Um, it, it's it's a Matrix room in its own right. This is a Matrix room in its own right. I can't merge them, and it's probably not fair. Um, so that's fine. Brian, to answer your question, um, you can use IRC to block uh, a cloak. Um, so you could block you can block um, anyone you want. Um, and that's fine. And likewise, uh, if you're on Matrix, if you choose to move to a Matrix client, uh, and you obviously don't have to, um, you will always be asked to join. So people can't direct, direct the message you. What happens is they say, I want to message Brian. Brian gets a pop-up saying, this person wants to message you. Do you want to join the room? And you can choose to say no. Uh, and that's per user. Um, so it's absolutely fine. That, that's that's a matrix thing. Obviously, if my IRC, you would manage it in the same way that you'd manage any IRC user. If you stay on IRC, then all the matrix users look like IRC users, and they will have appropriate metadata cloaks, <clears throat> not cloaks, sorry, user masks, which can be used to set your flags. Um, so I think that's everything I want to say. My um, So my goal is, is, as I said, this is about... This is about defaults. This is about what do we want the new members to the community to see and to experience, and how do we make best use of those features? I think it's got a lot of positives, and I think that the whilst I'm not going to say there are no downsides, that's clearly not true. I think they are manageable, um, and I think the Matrix team is very sorry. The Element team, get my naming right, are very alive to how they can help with that. Um, so. More to come. Definitely going to do, run some experiments in the next month or so about running conferences on Matrix. I'm very keen to hear people's thoughts on that as an idea. As I say, because it will just be a web stream embedded in Element, it should work just fine for IRC as well. Uh, if that goes well, I, I'm going to make the proposal of trying that for the next Contributor Summit. Um, partly because it will be at first, and that's usually a bigger audience where we struggle to get everybody in one room anyway. Um, so that might make sense to have a publisher and then everybody else, uh, like a published stream with speakers and everybody else in a, in a main chat channel. And as soon as you're doing that, it's much more sensible to, to think about running that in our daily chat channel anyway. Uh, so I'm going to run some tests. I'm happy. If anyone wants to volunteer to help me test it, then get in touch. Um, but I think even if nobody wants to, I can buttonhole enough volunteers in the community team to, uh, to try it out. Um, there are definitely some open questions. Um, I'm not clear how we will do polls on that yet, and I am not clear on how I will do the recordings for that yet. The live stuff definitely works because I've tested it. Um, but polls polls are something we use quite a bit in our talks these days, and recordings are definitely important. So. Um, Yes, uh, I'm very, uh, very excited to see where we can take this um, and questions. Alex, did you have a question? Alex. Uh, me? Yeah, sorry. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. That was actually a very informative presentation. And I just wanted to say, uh, yeah, I would like to help. You actually made me try to install the metric server again. <laughs> I, it's one thing I haven't talked about is what what it means to have a matrix server. You don't need one. I mean, if you want one, yeah. that's fine. Alex, I encourage you to go do it. Um, matrix home servers are equivalent to your email server, right? Most people are going to end up with Gmail or, or whatever they want to use, right? Not that many people run their own mail servers, although I suspect this audience may be slightly more biased in that direction than some. But... Um, but yes, uh, Matrix home servers are not required. We are almost certainly going to uh, ask or look at getting uh, an Ansible one um, because that's a good way to support uh, another you know, solid open source project and team. Uh, so in the same way, Fedora are actually getting two home servers, as I understand it. Um, so they're going to have one that most people are like signed up on with open registration and then like an official Fedora one that hosts all the rooms. Honestly, I'm not clear why they're doing that. It seems a bit odd to me, but I don't know. Um, so, uh, so they're going to have like multiple home servers. We're going to look into exactly how we want to uh, 
structure that literally this is all off the back of the conversation i had yesterday so still thinking through the implications of that uh, both cost implications and like structural implications but certainly there will almost certainly be a home server uh, open questions are whether we have open registration on that so people want an ansible matrix address that can get one or whether that's something that we try to um limit in some way and that would be limited only because cost basis uh, rather than because we don't want people to have them right so um, that's kind of um, the thoughts there, but you don't need a home server, right? Um, so if you want to play with one, great, but by all means, just grab uh, uh, matrix.org or other home server account. Um, you know, on the usual disclaimer, if you're going to grab an account on, on someone else's home server, make sure you trust them to some degree. Uh, but, uh, but everything should be largely encrypted unless it's a public room anyway. Uh, good, sorry, yes. Um, can I share the hack empty that you have been? Um, yeah, let me just um, let me let me later. just check because I, I put in the notes from our meeting with um, Element yesterday, and there were definitely some things that were kind of um, I won't say NDA, but were, were things we were talking about. Um, uh, Gundler, do you see anything in there that we shouldn't um, make public? I think the only thing is there's some pricing information that we might want to. Move just, somewhere else. Yeah, just remove that line. I can remember the numbers. Yeah. Okay. We, yeah. we can add, add to the um, notes later, so no, no, no worries. That's fine. I, I have I have made the edit, so by all means, uh, you can share that now. I need to add some more to that because Element came back to me at about five p.m. yesterday with some of the answers to my open questions, which I need to add into this document. I will do that um, once once I've finished presenting. All right. Thank you. Is, is anyone? concerned with what we've talked about like you know we hopefully made it clear that irc isn't going away you know and that will never happen i'm definitely much and very much in the irc for life card right i've been using irc almost as long as i've been using pieces but you know has greg hopefully put to rest any of the concerns about the matrix side does anyone still concern there does anyone think we shouldn't have matrix as the default and by that i mean the first thing listed in documentation from a technical point, it doesn't matter. To, to put some vision on that, um, my goal, and this will take a while because spaces is not out of beta, but my goal will be a link to the space is what goes at the very top of the documentation. And you say something like, Ansible exists in many places. If you're not sure where you're going, click here. Uh, and that drops you into Element in that space where you can get a nice overview with suggested channels and people can come and jump in. What you would put there today would be a link direct to the Ansible community room so that people can come and ask questions. Because if you try and look at a space in a client that doesn't have spaces enabled, it doesn't look great at the moment. It's not terrible, it does work, but it's not ideal. It looks like a room to people who don't have spaces enabled, and then you can't talk because it's not really a room. Uh, so uh, so that's you can't put that in the docs until spaces makes it out of beta. Uh, but for now, we can signpost people to the Ansible community room, and then you know, we can take it from there. All right, thanks, Greg. Right. This is, well, it's probably going to be a discussion and work in progress for a while, so feel free to contact us and Greg um, with your thoughts and comments. Let's uh, go on. Gondolo, I think you have two kind of sessions, so feel free to go ahead and start off how you want it. Thank you very much. So I'm going to try some new technology, which is always fun, because I only set it up. And thanks to the people, Park Marco, that helped me test this. We're going to try using the Google Jamboards functionality. So similar to where the um, the poll option is so triangle, square, circle. You should see a link for whiteboarding. If you click that, there is a file with a pretty useless name that says 8th of June 2021 on it. If you click on that, you should then get the channel visible, which hopefully everyone has edit powers. I will also share that because it doesn't seem to get shared by default. Yep, we see it. Cool. Um, so I'm trying to do this and make it a bit more interactive because I realize it's it's difficult of why some people don't always like um, going off mute and, and talking. Um, so this is Google Channel Board. On the left-hand side of the screen, you should see these options. And if you click this little post-it now, 
Uh, you can put some notes in and then just save that and it will go on. We have two boards here, uh, which you've got this number one and number two. So the first one is paper cuts and the second one is where would you like to see the community be in 12 to 18 months. So let me just give a bit of context about what's been happening over the last few months. Um, I'm really excited to work at Red Hat um, for many reasons, one of which is that they actually gave me a team of five people um, that we've been hiring uh, since November last year, and Andrew was the last person to join in March. So now we have a lot more people. We can obviously think a bit more and a bit more strategically about where is the team or where is the community we want to go. Um, now that I don't want to say everyone fully understands everything, but you know we've got our, got our feet under the table and we understand what's going on a bit more, uh, we can start to have these discussions, and it's great that we have this um, contributor summit uh, today, uh, so we can hopefully get some feedback on that. But, uh, internally, in, in, in some of the RC meetings, we've sort of been talking about this in, in two different ways. There's the where do we want to be in 12 to 18 months? Where's the direction that we want to be? You know, if we have a direction, we can then kind of do things to move in that direction. Now, this is all the common stuff about planning and all the advantages of, of those good things. Um, and we go to that, so that's number two. Um, and, you know, we need to remember that there is a life outside of collections. I know that's sort of been the, the big, big ugly thing definitely to start with, but now we've sort of settled down a bit. Still a lot to do there. Um, however, we are thinking about, I'll just tweet this a bit. Some of the wide ranging issues around like the steering committee, which John Progress is going to talk a little bit about later, about the upstream and downstream relationship, you know, meetups that the cover looks at, the training that Umbragash has uh, been looking at, I'm going to talk a bit about later, how we onboard maintainers. And it sort of all comes down to what would we want to define a healthy and robust uh, and autonomous, I think is an important word in there. And by that, I mean not reliant on people on, on Red Hat community. Um, so I hope everyone's coffee has kicked in. Um, because these are a bit, a bit soul searching for what is probably a, early on a Tuesday morning for most of you. So that's sort of the, the bigger strategic aim, which is on a uh, slide. So page two of the Jamboard, and if we go back to page one using the option at the top, we have almost the polar opposite of that. It's the what are the tiny little things? What are the little annoyances? What are the, oh, if I just have half an hour to fix this thing, or I don't know how to, it wouldn't it be cool if this other thing happened in a slightly different way? Um, I'd, I'd like as my team to sort of balance these two bits out a bit. So we're making a continual set of improvement. I think the Japanese have a term for it. It's uh, Kaizen. So a continual gradual improvement rather than big step change. So you just continually just making little improvements rather than big bang and often crash. Um, so two things that we're currently working on is you may be aware that we have a Ansible collection template repository. Um, which is called like the default GitHub Actions and the README, various different bits. So whenever someone wants a new collection, we say clone that and go in and change a load of bits. Uh, Ansible collection in it, the command line, um, has support for putting in different types of templates. So we can actually put it in there, and then rather than you clone this repository and then having to manually change a load of stuff, you can just run this command and your repository will get the GitHub workflow set up correctly rather than having to fix stuff for better readme and a load of different things. It's probably a week's work, week's worth of work for, to implement and put a test in place for that. But we hope that it'll make everyone's lives just a little bit easier. So that's an example of something we're thinking. I know another thing that sometimes people um, trip up on is when you're running Ansible tests, say with unit or integration or sanity tests, uh, against the collection, that it can be a bit confusing if you've not got the directory structure set right. Um, so maybe there's some things we can do there to either make Ansible test support a different thing or to maybe change the the error message and give a bit more guidance. So those are sort of two starting things. Um, what else are 
of uh, people thinking other little things where people get irritated or think we can make some little improvements. So people can open this. So again, if you go to the uh, triangle, circle, square option, you can, everyone should have the edit ability on this. So feel free to put bits in. Or, or shout out and output stuff. Is, are people awake, people engaged, people, or, or maybe everyone's happy and we can go and find something to do, go to sleep. Ryan right, is also asleep, thank you. Um, you know, there, there must be some little things that just irritate you. Or, may, or maybe you want to start with a, I don't know, where, where do you want to start? Do you want to start with the smaller bits or the bigger bits? Let's start, let's start with the strategic stuff. Um, I don't know whether this matters. I mean, this may only matter to me, uh, which is fair. But in 12, knowing where we want to get to in 12 to 18 months helps me understand what data we'll need to make sure we get there. And that's something I'm struggling with right now, is what do people need to see? Um, it's not easy to know what what data to collect, what reports to work on, what models to build when we don't know where we're trying to get to. So this this question is actively interesting to me. I don't have an answer for you <laughs> because um, I'm sat on the wrong side of the fence. But yeah, this is something I would I would love to to clarify more. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. Thanks, Fred. Because once we've worked out this, we will go well. What are the you know going project lengths? What are the steps to get there? How do we track if we're moving in the right direction? And obviously, we've got great skills to, to help them that. The crows appear to be fighting the side if you can hear strange noise. Um, so let's talk a bit about the more strategic stuff, right? So there's some sort of concrete stuff we can do. We know we've talked today about the three new contributors we've got on board, which is great. I think we're all agreed that we need to continue doing that, um, how we do that, and one of the collections of the next priority is probably something that we need to, to work through and, and how to find those and training and mentorship uh, would also be good. Um, I think Andrew's just dropped off the moment, but he's been doing some good work on how to uh, so document what the maintainers' roles and responsibilities are and information that they need. Um, one of the bigger things that I'm, I'm really interested in what people think here is around the sort of health and governance of the upstream project and how we how we scale the rest of this. Um, if anyone has any has any thoughts, or well, I don't know how people want to do this. If, if people do have thoughts and want to just open up the jamboard and put them in. Um, I'm not sure if. Felix Fontaine. Felix, are you still uh, around? I'm still around. Cool. Um, I'm just going to pick on you if that's all right to try and get the conversation <laughs> playing a bit more. Because um, mm. I know you've been doing a lot of great stuff around the, the build process and the, and the doc stuff. Are you, do you think there's other, or what other bits do you think we could do there, or, or, or maybe related? Because I know obviously a lot of them you just can fix yourself. But um, I've already been thinking a bit, but I, I, I think that. The worst or the, the most common pain point is probably um, well running Ansible test in the wrong directory structure, and that's already on the list. So, oh, that's um, good. I want that. Well, at least that's the one I heard most often. I think um, about I mean about docs build or something. It's it's not something many people do, so I'm not sure if they are. If that's really a big problem, I mean, for for me personally, the the biggest problem is when trying to do the doc side build that you it doesn't really work when you have um when you use an editable install of Ansible <laughs> because it it tries to do something with the um well it it uses Ansible and um and that one has some 
I mean, it, it, it tries to do funny things and then stuff breaks. <laughs> but there, I mean, you need to know how it works to work around it. But I, that's probably a problem almost nobody has except me. So, so uh, apropos problems that nobody has except me. Uh, <laughs> I, I think I am one of these guys who, who wants to discover a lot of stuff. And uh, since I'm digging into how to contribute to stuff and how to properly create a collection that is, um, yeah, let's say community approved or whatnot, yeah, how, however you want to name it, so that it's looking nice and it's well tested and thoroughly tested. Um, it's, it's very hard to discover these best practices that are currently, um, I, I don't know where they are documented and, and how thoroughly, but from my perspective, making this stuff, how to become a maintainer and, and maybe how to create a collection that is in the community best practices with, with a boilerplate example and a very thorough documentation, how to get started uh, would be awesome for me. Um, and maybe even for other contributors that just aren't here and, and struggle to contribute anyway, since they haven't discovered a way to, to start it. What, what would you like to, to see, Matt, Daniel? Um, um, maybe, maybe a one page or so, hey, we are, we are having some best practices. These are, for example, here, 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 here. Yeah, similar to, our, uh, to the community page where you can see the, the IRC channel, a collection of stuff that you need to know to maintain a collection. And in addition, maybe a boilerplate repository or skeleton repository uh, where some of these best practices are very thoroughly documented. Ah, so like a, like a, a real collection or a... Yeah, an, an, example, a, an example collection that applies a ton of best practices that are currently very common in the collections, especially for modules and plugins and stuff like this. It doesn't need to be something fancy, maybe it's something very simple. Yeah, so I have seen, for example, on the, uh, it was opensource.com, I think, not sure. There, there was a small guide um, how you can write your first module. It's five years old or so. Um, maybe something in, in this way, but current, <laughs> actually. So not outdated. I don't know if people remember the, pedantically commented playbook, but something similar could be done for the collection. Yeah, I like, I like the idea of that, because I, I think we've got reasonable reference material under like the, the dev guide. Yeah, yeah so, so it's but, material. But I, like, I like the idea of pulling it together to um, a real thing. I, 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 I used to be a big Microsoft user, and I, in my mind, I always come back to um, Northwind, uh, okay. which if you used to use Office, I think it was only in the office we was was Microsoft's fake company. So you get a load of like sample northern databases and spreadsheets and that's it. So there's a sort of example of how to how to use this stuff. You know, it's the the old school ex, uh, example.net or example.com yeah. or actually so there was a webinar on ansible.com slash webinars. I'm not sure how it was named. It's quite old. And somebody talked about uh, best practice for modules and roles in the same webinar. And it was stuff like uh, defaults must be set and that you have to comment stuff and uh, how you can clean code it and how you use variables properly, uh, this kind of things, how you define mandatory variables and, and where should you define them. Um, and this was a quite, quite nice webinar, but I don't know if, if somebody who just wants to get an idea how to contribute uh, is able to discover this webinar and if it's even still valid and up to date. Yeah, I like that. Thank you very much. What else are people thinking? Let's, let's call it an entry point or so uh, for new maintainers. <laughs> Good chat going on with Brian here in, in, in chat. Sorry, <laughs> that's a bad double. Um, 
just talking about the reports that I do internally. So for those of you not aware, um, I do a report every week for Gondola's team, um, which looks at the rates of opening and closing issues in PRs, the number of maintainers in each repo, the number of open issues in PRs in each repo and ranks, you know, does a table of those, like top 10 of those, um, the time to close uh, in a principled way, not using a mean, as I've talked about before. Um, and and I provide that and like you know the the date that um, the number of days since a repo was last committed to like the date just straightforward data like that and it, and the the aim is to help Gundo and his team understand where they might need to reach out to people and have an impact. Now I don't publish those, and the reason I don't publish those is because I don't want to make if 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 someone is struggling with a repo if you know if their time to merge is going up if they're not getting to their issues and there's a genuine life reason why that's happening then I don't want to make it worse by putting them at the top of a leaderboard and saying you're doing terribly, right? Um, so. So, so I don't publish those reports, um, but you know, Brian makes the good point that you know it is it is also kind of difficult to match resources to people if you don't know where the help is needed. If there is genuine acceptance from the maintainers that this would be useful, I'd be happy to do a version of that report and make it public on a regular basis. Um, but I, I, I genuinely don't want to make people feel bad if if they see like that they're doing really <laughs> that they've got like these horrible time to merge and everything. Um, some of those ones we know are bad, right? Like I don't even bother to do the stats for community general and community network because they're so completely different in structure to everything else. Um, but um, but you know you you you'll you'll see some regular and unsurprising names at the top of those lists, and then there are other ones that that you might not be so surprised about. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm open to that, and if that will help um, people to understand where there is work to do then I'm very happy to work with maintainers on something that looks sensible. Um, but I'm not going to publish it without buy-in from a, a decent chunk of the maintainers because I don't gen genuinely don't want to make burnout worse when maintaining maintaining things is absolutely the most thankless task out there, right? Um, so, yeah, happy to discuss that more either later or whenever. Yeah, just to point out, the last thing I meant of the, that to become a wall of shame, it's more or less a, a help-wanted would be yeah. my approach is this is where help is needed where there's no not enough resource yeah. or yeah. not enough expertise or just hands because uh, i mean community general is always going to have that problem because it's a, a vast array of everything that used to be the yeah. problem we had when it was uh oh you're gonna meet right I think what he was going to say was that that was the problem in Ansible Ansible before we moved everything to collections, which I would 100% agree with. And one of the things I track is like where the total number of open PRs is forecast to go, um, because I don't want to go back there. Um, and I should probably show one of those reports at some point, because it's actually not looking too bad at the moment. But um, you know, anyway, that's a different conversation. But yeah, wording is, is tricky, uh, and making sure we, if I can say the word sell it in the right way, um, is, I think, uh, important, but yeah, happy to happy to have a conversation about that at some point. But I'm probably taking up too much time for this discussion right now. No, I think it's all very relevant. Oh, Ansible test will encounter locker hub rate limit. That was not something I knew about. So thank you for ever put that in. That feels like something we should be able to to solve. It, Ansible test should be caching things, but I guess if you're running it in CI, then Maybe you won't, so maybe we can um, maybe that would help. Uh, where would people like us to be in? In a in a year or a year and a half, um, is there a sort of end goal that anyone's thought of, or what might consider a healthy community? Um, I, I sort of assume that people would like to be spending more time on things that aren't collections and building up maybe communities of um, other projects, um, but that's just me assuming rather than. Yes, that's a good point. Um, whoever put the uh, Ansible test Docker hub rate limit in, can you just see the 
the comment in the chat that Felix has just added. I think uh, it can only really happen if either you're using your own Docker containers. I think you can also t you tell Ansible. T I mean, by default, it uses the containers that it knows about. But I yeah. think you can also put in arbitrary names, and that might be the problem, or that the tests themselves use Docker containers. Maybe, but I, or, or someone's using a very old version of Ansible test. It um, must be really old. <laughs> uh, but yeah, this, this and that Jamboard, would be interesting to know what the problem is. Yeah, Jamboard's anonymous, so I can't see who put that in. Um, I want to talk briefly, just mention this one briefly. Um, so I, I think it's fair to say that community Galaxy, so galaxy.ansible.com, and the code base behind it has sort of become a bit unloved over the past few years. Most of the engineering focus has been put on Galaxy NG next generation. That's the code base um, for uh, Automation Hub, which is one of the new shiny development stuff going on. Um, the plan is that we will um, add the necessary role support into Galaxy NG and then Galaxy Ansible.com that you are used to will get replaced with uh, um, Galaxy NG. So we'll just have a single code base. It might be installable in different ways like on prem, uh, community mode, or automation hub mode. Um, but we'll have one thing, one code base with one set of people actually maintaining rather than the sort of orphan code base that we have today that's bit rotting. Um, we will try and build up a community around this. I think once we get that in place, it's much more important that we get people helping. This will give us um, docs for every collection in Galaxy um, as well, which is quite cool. I know something that's often wanted. Um, I'll dig up some more links and put those in the meeting notes about that. Thank you, Brian. Um, what, what would other people like to see over the next sort of 12 to 18 months? So the, the people have thoughts about what a successful community would look like or what um, uh, how, what, what else we can do to sort of decentralize or to scale up? Is it just a case of adding more maintainers? Is there something more that's needed there? I also realized that maybe putting, trying to do these things, these discussions like this maybe isn't the, the best way. With all the free and open games over the last couple of weeks, we didn't get a chance to sort of um, uh, share the agenda as widely as we would have done normally. Um, so if people think there's a better way of doing this stuff if we either share the agenda in advance or that we, so people can sort of mull about, think about stuff in advance and then put their thoughts and that's what maybe something we should do. Well, very quiet. Uh, Jorge mentioned in chat uh, that he wants to point out that there's only one Ubuntu-based Docker image for collection testing. It might be beneficial to have other distributions available. It's interesting. I thought we did have a couple. Let me have a look in the code. Ansible test for Ansible base 2.10 and Ansible 2.9 also has some more Ubuntu images than just 20.04. Um, yeah, um, um, my information can be a little bit outdated on this one because I haven't checked in a while. But uh, as far as I understood, the um, I mean, the way Ansible test works for collections, uh, the image um, to to be used uh, is sort of it's kind of hard coded in the whole tool, and it defaults to the one for collections, and there is only one. Um, at least you want to base, and uh, at least from my experience, uh, by testing um, the um, the community MySQL, um, I think it could be beneficial to have, for example, CentOS. We, we we get a number of issues on the collection saying that well, when we are using CentOS, um, this thing doesn't work, or this doesn't work like that, and it, it could be good to be able to to increase our metrics of of testing 
to to an environment that corresponds to these use cases. I think I know what the problem is. I think you're referring to the default image that's based on Ubuntu, but there are a lot of other operating system images already included with Ansible test. There are some for Fedora, there are some for CentOS, and there are several other ones. And um, depending on the collection, you can also access um, HREL and some more distributions or some VMs even. I mean, like Community General also has tests running on macOS and also on um, FreeBSD. And I think Community MySQL can also have that. Or my, I thought yeah, it um, already had, but I haven't checked. Yeah. Uh, okay, Felix. I, I do understand that. I, I have. Uh, I do know that there are the other uh, options. I when I last checked, I did check the Docker files of these images, and the default image for collections has a number of. Um, well, packages and, and other instructions on, on Docker file essentially convert, um, creates a, um, an utterly different image than the, the other ones that are available. Um, I don't know if it is because it's targeted towards collections only, uh, but well, at some point I did try to use one of the, the other distribution images and well, the test, the, the test just failed miserably at the beginning. So th there is some, uh, divergence in in there some, some somewhere. I mean, I'm I'm not a Docker expert. I just have a a, a quick look around, but they yeah. they they don't seem to be equivalent. Yeah, there are two different kinds of images. There's a default image which is mainly um, aimed at um, operating system independent tests and also at unit tests and sanity tests. And then there are operating system specific images like CentOS, Fedora, and Ubuntu, and so on. And um, depending on which one you use, if you use the wrong one, tests might not work, especially integration tests. So maybe it's because of that, but maybe we should discuss this in IRC later when <laughs> it yeah, might be easier. Yeah, yeah okay, yeah, you're, you're right, Robin. This this can, can drag along in, in um, <laughs> the longer discussion. But yeah, you're, you're right that that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so I guess my, the point that I was trying to make in the beginning is that we may want, in certain situations, to be able to run integration tests in environments other than Ubuntu. Yes, it's but, definitely a yeah. good idea. I mean, yeah, we, having we, more documentation we, is always good. Well, we can take this later then. <laughs> yeah, Ansible test is designed to do that, but it requires a lot of effort and maintenance and a lot of setup. Yeah, there's a few different things we can do when we're testing dedicated collections like using MySQL. Um, we could test against different operating systems, or we could put in a list of the specific MySQL um, server versions that we want to test against and test against that matrix or that matrix plus the My um, Python matrix. Um, yeah, let, let's chat on IRC. I can share some examples. And um, if you still have the a link to the PR where things are failing, we can take a look at that and give some advice. Um, well, this Jamboard will, will stay available. Um, so let's leave that open and people can have a think about stuff maybe as, uh, as we progress with today. People have some ideas, just feel free to, to put them in by clicking the little uh, post-it note icon here. Um, but yeah, we've got, we've got some new bits there, um, which I think is good. I like the idea of the entry point for collection maintainers. I think that's that's a really good, solid thing. Um, we've got a bit of that information, excuse me, already. Uh, but we just need to sort of uh, pull that stuff together. Uh, anyone got any final bits on that? Otherwise, we will break for our lunch break. Uh, there is some issue with uh, documentation links, uh, for example, uh, when I'm talking to uh, someone who has opened the PR and, and I want to uh, tell the guy uh, where to find the links, for example, how to uh, run the PR branch locally and test if uh, the fix, has, if, for example, my PR has fixed uh, uh, the OP issue or not. Uh, I don't know where to, where to tell them uh, where to find that documentation. I have opened the PR yesterday, uh, adding this to contributing that MD file at the root of the uh, repository, but I'm not sure 
uh, for example, I, I won't look for contributing that MD when I want to open a PR in a repository. I don't sure. know where should I put this. So I, I think in the new community docs repository, which I think you, you've seen, uh, Andrew's put yes. some guides in there about how to raise a, a pull request and, and branch and fork and how to do that. Um, so in uh, the I, individual repositories contributing MD, we can link back to, we should maybe link back to that file. Yes, I think that would be better if they're uh, all organized in one repository, but uh, my, my main concern is uh, we don't have the link to community that ducks every, anywhere. I haven't seen it anywhere. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. So we, we can, at the moment, it's just a repository that doc site isn't built anywhere yet because we still want to get the, the, the structure correct. Um, mm -hmm. So we're trying to avoid linking that, though it should be okay just to link directly to the files in, in GitHub if you want to do that. Uh, where should I put this? Where should you want to put this? I, I think from, like you say, from every collection repository, sorry, every collection repo should have a, a contributing to MD. So is that um, that would be fine. You mean in, in readme that MD, for example, yeah. right? And then in the readme that MD or the contributing MD, yeah. Mm -hmm. Best to have the link in both. Yeah. So it increase the chance that someone actually sees it. Yeah, good idea. Uh, but yeah, speak, speak with Anderson 007 about that because I, I know he's he's been thinking about that, but I'd love to get your views on it. I think it's also possible to include this uh, into issue forums because if the repo uses these new issue forums, you can uh, put an arbitrary text there with links. So that would be good. Yeah. Yeah, we can have the, because I think we've got a, a couple of lines about have you tried fixing this? So yep. Let's put into the contrib yeah, because you can put relative links in. Thank you for the suggestion. I just looked at the forum uh, in Ansible Ansible for the bug report, and actually there are two places linking uh, a default contributing MD file that are sort of outside of the form that we configure. So the one, one is at the very bottom under the submit new issue button, and the other one is uh, under helpful resources on the sidebar. And I believe if a person uh, files their very first uh, issue, uh, there should be some modal or pop-up uh, pointing at these helpful resources like contributing guidelines. Or if this uh, file has changed since their last uh, issue or at PR. Yes, I believe that's correct. Yeah. Um... But it could definitely be made more prominent there. Yeah, I, I, I often forget about those links. Maybe we can get it put in the um, right in the top. And to the thank yep. you for reporting the book. Yeah, I put that as a post-it note on the jump board. Thank you. Good idea. Cool. Uh, anyone got anything else? Otherwise, we'll break for some food. Oh, thank you, Carl. Thank you. Thanks, Candelo and everyone. So now we'll break for one hour. And um, I know it's called munch hour in the agenda. That was because uh, it's generally lunch for some people, but it could be you know break, snack, dinner, I don't know, depending on where you are. So I, I chose the word munch, which means like eating and chewing on stuff. So munch hour, uh, just in case some people didn't get the kind of play on words there. So um, feel free to take a break. I, I myself will, will get something to eat and uh, we'll be back in 57 minutes at the top of the hour for the second half of Contributor Summit. And feel free to <laughs> stream games or something or share whatever you're doing. <laughs>
doing this. No, I've, I've double booked myself. I have to drop okay. another meeting for a little bit. Um, I will be back just at the end. If everything, if I don't overrun, I'll be back at the end of the munch hour, but that means no time for streaming. I oh, probably can set it. something up one of the afternoon breaks, though. Uh, okay, sure for, the, for the <laughs> later break then. If I'm okay. late rejoining at 12, then uh, that's why. It's because I'm testing myself. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Enjoy your break. I can hang around for another 15 minutes or so and then I'll have to go. Right.